Then I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Armitage. He is an expert in electron microscopy. He studied at the Institute for Creation Research when it was down in San Diego, and I had the privilege of being, uh, I was working there at that institute at the same time. And, uh, uh, and we had the, the privilege of knowing some of the professors there, that some of them left an extremely deep impression in our hearts. And so I, I like to think this evening is dedicated to, to Dr. Uh, Dr. Dick Lumsden. And somehow in my heart that just strikes me as true. Anyway, uh, Mark is an excellent fellow. He, I would call him a, a, a genuine believer and a genuine scientist both. And he got his, uh, his uh, uh, doctorate in education uh, direct in, at uh, Liberty University. And so, uh, what, should, what else can we say? And he's, uh, so tonight we're going to learn about uh, uh, the secrets of Dimetrodon. All right? Now, if you don't know, Dimetrodon is not a, not a dinosaur. It's an ancient reptile, supposedly pre-reptile. And I'm really interested to hear what he has to say tonight because he's been finding uh, dinosaur soft tissue in a lot of different kind of creatures. And this one happens to be among the oldest, claimed to be, what, 295 million? years in yeah. age, and uh, uh, I think you're going to hear a slightly different story than that out of Mark tonight. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mark, for coming. He, him and his wife, they travel here from the, uh, what, what city are you Squim, in? Squim, up on the peninsula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he, up, up in the peninsula, a couple hours drive. Thank you, yeah. Mark. Thank you, Bill. It's so good to be here with you, and just to recollect our time together down there, and Wow, look back from this angle backwards in time to see who we rub shoulders with. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Great people, man. Yeah, great yeah. people. So we, we yeah. owe it to them, yeah. right, to do this kind of work. So, yeah. so thank you guys for letting me come. And uh, I'm glad you got a chance to see the bones. If you didn't get a chance uh, to see the bones, uh, please come up afterwards and we'll try to answer all your questions. Now, there's one other good thing that happens tonight. Everybody gets two free books. So we brought copies of our old stretchy, the dinosaur bone cell. Am I making enough of a mess of this, darling? Plus, I was supposed to turn this on, too. This is Welcome to the Mark Doesn't Know What He's Doing show. Okay? That's what this is called. Okay, but we have free books that we want you guys to take, and uh, I've even known to autograph those from time to time. Okay, this is our third year in a row to be here. So it's really great. It's great to be back. And we've got new stuff that you didn't see last year. Now, some of you guys, if, how many came last year and saw it last year? Okay, quite a few of you. So you saw some introduction to nerves last year. But you saw on the screen uh, a few minutes ago what's under this microscope, which is a nerve, but it's a Permian nerve. Okay? And it still has lipids in it. It still has fats in it. So we're going to talk about that. And I have some forensic scientists now who are very interested in this work because I think they understand the, uh, the logic and the reasoning behind it. I mean, to find the kind of structures that we're finding in ancient tissues, I call these impossible pictures. Okay, so that nerve that you saw on that microscope, that's an impossible picture. Why? It's not supposed to be there. Uh, these things supposedly turned to dust a long time ago. We're going to talk a little bit about the time tonight. But the first thing I want to do is introduce you to a new concept that we're uh, introducing now. We have, uh, re we have announced nationally that we are going to be offering uh, workshops, laboratories. <music> Hi folks, and a special greeting to our homeschool partners around the country. The Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute is bringing a hands-on microscope dinosaur soft tissue laboratory experience to a location near you. 
We just had a successful test run in Pennsylvania, and we provide everything you need, the bones from the digs, the slide making equipment, the microscope, so that you will have a wonderful laboratory experience with real dinosaur tissue. Students get to keep the bones that they worked with, the slides that they made, and any digital pictures that they take through our microscopes. They can talk, take all that home with them. But we teach our students to identify things like this nerve on the bottom of a decalcification dish. And so they learn to collect all these tissues and make slides that they can take home and continue to study. So we come for free. We do have a suggested donation. We can do 20 students per three-hour lab and let your students come and see real dinosaur nerves through high-quality microscopes with their own eyes and see why this work is respected by the scientific community. Distry.org also offers opportunities for a few individuals to come and dig with us at Hell Creek, in the Hell Creek Formation. Simply contact us at distry.org and you can come for a few days before the hands-on laboratory workshop and take your bones into the workshop to work on them. Labs are offered twice a year in the spring and fall, but seating is limited, so contact us quickly if you're interested in coming in the spring or the fall to dig. There are extra fees that apply, but we connect you right up with the dig operators who take you right to the site where you can find incredible specimens and you can dig for yourself for three days. Once again, those bones can be taken into the lab for hands-on work. We find all kinds of neat specimens like raptor teeth, like these nanotyrannus teeth. We're also finding T-Rex teeth. And if you're interested in claws, there are plenty of claws to go along with the teeth. So come dig with us for a few days before the laboratory and take those bones into the lab with you to process them. Many of these bones are hollow and so they have trabecular bone in them which are full of soft tissue. So the opportunities to find Vessels and veins, venule valves, osteocyte cells, and even nerves are very high. At our recent research dig in Norman, Oklahoma, we dug in the Permian and we were fortunate to locate and collect for laboratory study a femur of Dimetrodon uh, from approximately 230 to 290 million years of age according to the literature. In any event, these are the kind of specimens that we are locating. Uh, not only did we find this excellent uh, femur from Dimetrodon, uh, we also found other components of that creature. For example, we found a jaw with erupting teeth, uh, including the very front teeth and others that are embedded still in the bone. That's when still erupting from the bone and here's one erupting from the bone. So these are the kind of finds you could expect to find on our digs as we go. If you do come to dig with us, plan to cover your travel and living expenses on a daily basis and also there's a daily fee to pay to the dig operator. Sometimes the operators also charge some money for claws and teeth that you recover, but the fee is low. Contact us if you're interested in participating in a dig, and remember, space is limited. Thank you. Digging in the classroom. These are actual pictures taken by students. Those are two nerves collected by students and photographed by students. I have found that the easiest way to teach a PhD about dinosaur soft tissue is to use a middle schooler to show them how to do it. <laughs> and then they'll listen to you. Uh, some of the worst students that I ever had in academia were the PhDs that I had to train. Here's a vessel. That's a blood vessel. See that? Collected, right? It's, this is in a decal solution. Here's another nerve. This was Seth. He collected that nerve. So if these kids can do it, anybody can do it, right? <laughs> uh, by the way, if you do come on digs, I talked about the teeth. These teeth are serrated on both sides. These are nanotyrannus. He could cut you coming and going with his teeth, right? Like two steak knives on one. Uh, and so this is what they look like, that edge under the electron microscope. I used to have some really nice electron microscopes and I'm trying to 
to rebuild that lab. Uh, but digs are fun. So if, if you want to come with us or if you want to just be uh, connected with the dig operators and they can plan a dig for you, uh, we can arrange that. So Dimetrodon, this is an interesting creature, uh, an amphibian reptile, kind of, kind of sort of halfway between. And this is that period, supposedly 275 to 295 million years ago, where these creatures uh, were dominant. This is before the, the dinosaurs came on the scene. And uh, they could get pretty large. Uh, they could probably swallow me. I think, I mean, I'm not that trim, but I might be that tall. I don't know. But uh, this, this was a big creature, 6 to 13 feet long, upwards of 550 pounds. He's well known for these vertebrae, these, these extensions. This is bone, folks. These are bones that come right off the vertebral column. All these vertebrae have these long, and they've cross-sectioned these, and I'll show you some of those pictures. We do a lot of thin sectioning with the bones uh, that we work with, and you will see this tonight, the, the, the results of thin sectioning. Uh, the literature says these have been extinct 40 million years before the dinosaurs even showed up on the scene. So these are really old. Uh, 30 different species in this group, mostly from the United States. Now, isn't that interesting? Have you ever seen uh, a map of Pangaea? You know what I'm talking about when I say Pangaea is when the, all the continents were supposedly in one place. All right, well, Oklahoma was kind of right there in the middle. <laughs> And it had to travel a long way. And what's really interesting is most of the specimens, even though they traveled 8,000 miles from where they were deposited, yeah, 8,000 miles from where they were deposited to where they're found today, they're mostly still concentrated in the United States. I think a couple have been found in Germany, but that's about it. So how, how was this concentration achieved? And especially over that time, frame and especially over that distance right so we've, we've got a lot of questions about where these bones end up and so this is the guy that we studied here this femur we have it on the table over there we only thin sectioned a part of it so you can actually handle uh, pieces of the femur and you can see the tooth that we collected we got a whole jaw I'll show you a picture of that but again thought to be very very old so consider the time element what if you could live a thousand years on this planet? What was it thousand years ago, right? Uh, 1200, right? 1100, right? What was going on in 1100? What, when was the Magna Carta signed? I can't even. 1215, okay. So even before. William Conquer, 1066. Right? 1066, right? So imagine that you started your life at that point, and now you're a thousand years old today, right? You've lived through all that. Imagine that. Now, do that 290,000 times. And that's what kind of time we're talking about here. It's almost incomprehensible, this amount of time. One landmass, Pangaea, moved about 8,000 miles. Now, many of these limb bones are pristine. We examine them. They're, they're collected, very interestingly, in a set of what they call fissure fills. They're actually little tubes of sedimentary rock that are deposited vertically in Oklahoma. And they're mostly found in those, those tubes. Uh, so how is that explained? We, we, it just doesn't make sense from a, a uh, plate tectonics point of view. And when you think about bone, what I want you to think about now mostly is blood. All right? Don't think about the soft tissues right now. Bone itself is a soft tissue. The, the actual bone mineral, the hydroxyapatite that makes up the bone, is considered soft. It is a mineral, but it is soft. And so this is considered a living soft tissue. In fact, there are cells in your bones that dissolve bone every day. And there are other cells that make bone every day. And it turns out every 15 years, your whole skeleton gets recycled. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Why do we still have aches and pains from 40 years ago? Though? Well, <laughs> that's soft tissue damage, brother. We could talk a lot about that. I know all about that. But no, I mean, there's micro cracks in here and all these little cells, these osteocytes, which my students are finding readily, all these osteocytes have all these little thread feet. See these little fingers coming off of each cell? Well, they go in every direction and they all touch each other. All these cells are touching. They have gap junctions, and they communicate with each other. Why? What are they, 
What are they sending to each other? Information about cracks in the bone, defects. That's why they erase stuff and rebuild it. It's called remodeling. And we'd actually, we can actually see this when we thin section the bone. You can see some of the remodeling. But the important thing I want you to remember is the canals. That's a blood canal. It's also called a bone canal, but that's where the blood travels, inside those canals. So right now, just think blood, okay? Because blood is important. Blood has, has really become an important issue in dinosaur soft tissue. How many of you have heard of the blood preservation theory? Okay, nobody has. Okay, when we find nerves or cells or blood vessels in these bones, um, and we look at the age, for example, Triceratops, 68 to 70 million years of age, how can these tissues still be there? Right? I was trained as a soft tissue expert. When I started reading this stuff in the literature, that's when I got accepted. Why? They were doing my job. <laughs> they were doing my job in these labs, getting these soft tissues out of there. I was trained to work in soft tissue. I'm really a soft tissue expert because microscopy is like 80% tissue processing and 20% viewing and photographing, right? All the work takes place up front. So I was trained in removing and, and preserving these kind of tissues so it fit with my work. But what I didn't realize is how important the blood is. Now the scientists today say it's the blood that's preserving the soft tissue. It's the blood that's preserving the soft tissue. You might say, well, how does, how does the blood, I mean, blood, it clots, right? It turns hard. It gets flaky and dry and it turns to powder over time, right? I mean, you've seen dried blood on the ground. Yeah, you know that stuff doesn't last for long. So how is it preserving the tissue? Well, they say the iron. The iron in the blood is preserving the tissue. It's cross-linking the tissue somehow so that they hold together and they don't fall apart over 68 million years. That's the theory. So the blood is important, yeah? But what if the blood never came out of the canals? Could the blood do the preserving in the, tissue, in the bone if it's still stuck in the canals? That's a good question to ask because that's what we're finding. We take these bones that we collect out of the ground and we thin section them. We make them one half the diameter of one of your hairs in thickness. So we shave it down until it's half the diameter of one of your hairs. That's about 50 microns thin. And then we put it on a microscope and this is what it looks like. And you see all these canals. Remember we've cross sectioned the bone, a thin section right through the bone. And now you're looking at those canals in cross section, right? So you see the bone, here's all the bone. It's kind of brown, why is it brown? Well, it kind of ages in the ground over time, right? Uh, it's not sitting on the surface where it gets bleached. When we went to Oklahoma, we found a lot of cow bones out there, all bleached white, right? These things are in the ground, so they turn brown over time. There's, a, there's an actual chemical decomposition that they talk about. But notice all this really black stuff. See all that? What's all this black stuff? A bunch of it over here. And a lot of it seems to be in these canals, doesn't it? Well, we thought those were blood clots. But we didn't really have a good way to find out if they were. And so what we discovered was, by reading the literature, that we could examine these under a very narrow wavelength of light, UV. That's very dangerous. UV will burn your retina right out of your eye. So <laughs> you have to use a very well-protected microscope. But what we did is we found the clots in the bone and we photographed them. See the clots in here? Here you can see the bone. You can see the lamellae. These are the lines, the way the bones are built along lines. The canal, of course, is almost completely full except for a little hole here in the center. This is all crystallized blood. It's all clotted. Here they're fully, occ fully occluded, completely blocked out. That's ver tri Triceratops vertebra and the horn. So we thin sectioned a bunch of these. Horn, frill, condyle, rib, vertebra, and all of them had clots. We, we looked at six different Triceratops individuals. Every single one of them had clots. 
And this is what they look like under the UV microscope. So what does that mean? That's the iron reacting to the UV light. The light you're seeing coming back to you, this is light that I'm bouncing off the clot through the microscope. So the slide is down here. I have a big bright light source up here coming down, hitting it with UV, and all that light is coming off the blood, the clot, and it's shining to the camera. So that's the UV, the, uh, the iron reacting to the UV. So we know that's iron in here because it's reacting to the UV. Does that make sense? This is called autofluorescence. What does that mean? You hit something with bright light, it gives off light. Remember Moses' face? Same principle. If I hit soft tissue with light, it will glow light in the microscope. It's own light. And that's what the iron is doing. It's glowing, saying, I'm here, and I'm not out here. See that? I'm in the canal. All the iron's in the canal, and I'm not out here. I'm not out here preserving all the tissue. Where am I? I'm in the canal still. You beginning to see that? Here's another example. This is, this is the frill. Here, I've only photographed half of the canal, but look at that bright line. Look at that line there that's not demarcated. That's a very sharp line right there. I mean, it is demarcated. It's a very sharp line showing that the iron is all still in here and it hasn't leaked out into the bone. Look at that. It hasn't leaked out into the bone. Now, what does this mean? Why are clots important? There's a medical condition in the literature called disseminated intravascular coagulation. What it means is when you drown, you know you're drowning. You know you're dying. You know that you are losing your life and your tension goes off the scale, your anxiety, everything goes off the scale. And so this begins to affect your blood clotting cascade. And because of the trauma inflicted on you, as you die, your blood begins to clot systemically throughout your entire body. If you remain in that condition dead, you have blood clots throughout your entire body. If you are revived while you're drowning, if you are revived and taken to the ER, what happens? The blood clotting cascade, which went in one direction to clotting, starts to reverse and you bleed out. And now the physicians are trying to save your life because you're bleeding out. It's a one-way reaction, one way or the other. If you die by drowning, you have clots throughout your bones. Now, the, the tissue's gone, right? The, the outer tissue, that all decayed away, but it's still in the bones. If you die by natural causes, what happens to your blood? Do you clot? If you just, say, die in your sleep. Does your blood clot? No, it pools to the bottom of your body. It pools on the bottom. So all of these bones are showing evidence of drowning in liquid, dying in that condition. Now, I did another little test. Uh, this was all published. This is published in Microscopy Today 2020. This was, uh, when was this, Dr. Whitaker? This was last August, wasn't it? 2020, August 2020. And I did a little microscopy trick here. I took a steel pin, which is not as dense as iron, right? And I put it on the bottom of the stage, and I put light through it, and I put UV light in, and you can see that the iron is denser than the pin that I put on the bottom of the microscope. So I, I, I showed you that because it's, it's a trick that's going to show up again in the new work. So... That is a review of the blood clot work that we already published. And you understand what I mean by published, right? This is in a scientific journal called Microscopy Today already. Every PhD on the planet can search this, and they're reading this work. Well, in 2021, in May, we went to Oklahoma to dig in the Permian for the per first time. Now, this is not Cretaceous. This is not 68 to 78 million years old. This is 275 to 295 million years old, okay? And it's well established in the literature. We went with Bill May of the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History. In fact, many of the specimens that you see from the Permian on our table, those are all from the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History. So we're beginning collaboration with them and starting to work on their specimens, which is very exciting. 
So this site that we went to is well understood in the literature. 17 years this has already been known in the literature. So that's where we went to dig. And this is what we try to do. We try to go to the dig sites that are already characterized in the literature. People already know what these sites are when we go to dig. So there's the femur. And this was permineralized. This was completely hardened into rock. And so we weren't able to recover any soft tissues from it. But we did collect something else a lot more interesting. Here's a piece of jaw. This is dimetrodon jaw. See these teeth erupting? There's a tooth erupting. Another couple of teeth erupting. Here's another jaw with a whole tooth. We thin sectioned this whole tooth. So you're going to see sections of this, sections of this, and sections of that femur. Now, when you look in the literature at the thin sections that are there, I can see the clots. Can you see the clots? I can see them. For some reason, nobody else can see them because nobody talks about these in the literature. <laughs> but I, I see them everywhere in all of the papers that I look at. And, and, and the paper that I have right now submitted for publication, we're waiting for the editor to review it. I made the point. All of the specimens that have been photographed and that I can see in the literature simply await my opportunity to examine their specimens under my microscope. That's the statement I made in the paper because nobody else is doing this work and I need to encourage them to do it and to verify what we're finding. So I can already see clots in their specimens and I certainly see them in mine. We dug in um, Colorado uh, two summers ago <clears throat> and we collected Camarasaurus, which I don't know if you've ever been to the Field uh, House Museum in, in uh, Vernal, Utah. That's a great trip to go to. Go, go to that museum. Because they have a Camarasaurus in the entryway there. And it's about 30 feet high and about 60 feet long. And this guy, you can see the clots right in here. Even though these are really damaged. Uh, the, these, these fossils have been really reworked. But you can still see the clots in them. All right, so here's a thin section now of the femur. This is the dimetrodon femur. We've thin sectioned it. It's about half the width of one of your hairs. It's permineralized, which means it has calcite in it. So this is calcite. Thank you, Bill. This is calcite. That, that infiltrated in a liquid state and hardened into rock. So if you picked up that femur over there, <laughs> you realize that that's solid rock. You could feel it. And so that's the calcite infiltrating, but look at the canal. What's that? That's a clot in the canal. And we put it under UV. Look at that. Look at all that iron saying, I'm here and not there. See that? 275 million years old, still has a clot in it. How's that possible? Here's another one. Now this is in a Herversian canal. That's what they call this. This is a Haversian canal. Remember the canal's going that way into the screen. The blood travels this way out of the screen the other way. Yeah. And you can see all the bone cells. Look at all the bone cells in here. These are all bone cells. And here's the, the lamellae. That's the line around the canal. And that's all the iron glowing. And then you just do UV and nothing but iron. So we have great corroboration of blood clots in these ancient specimens. Now look at, look at the red arrows. What are the red arrows pointing to? Well, remember, these are tubes. And so that's the rest of the tube of iron going down below the plane of focus. You can see how it's extending through the thin section. If I had optics that could look five inches into the thin section, I would see that clot going all the way through. Yeah? And here it is in UV. So we're finding clots now in tissues that were not supposed to be from the same event. But I think these are from the same event. Here's jaw. Look at all these beautiful cells in circular motion around the canal. And here's the canal glowing under UV. This is tooth. Here's all 
the Habersian lamellae, all the bone cells in there. Here's the clot. And look at how irregular that is. So there's a lot of interesting areas of study in these clots. Here's another shot of the tooth. Now, now, one of the things I want to point out to you is look at the scratch marks in the metal. You see the polishing marks? That's from us polishing that metal. So the metal is malleable, right? You can, you can hit metal with a hammer and bend it. Well, we, we put scratches in it. Here's a rib. Look at that. Look at the beautiful surface scratches in that. But the scratches aren't out here. So the bone doesn't scratch, right, when we're doing this fine polishing, but the metal does, all right? There's another beautiful one. That's dimetrodon rib. So we're finding clots in these specimens this age. Now here's, a, here's a crack that propagates through, but look at how it didn't separate the bone, but it separated the metal through that crack, but it still glows. So. So what do the clots mean? The clots mean that the iron preservation theory is put into question. Why? Why is it put into question? Well, first of all, it shows that these things probably died by drowning and are demonstrating dis disseminated intravascular coagulation again, versus the pooling, right? The clots, what? Sequester the iron from Fenton reactions. Okay, Mark, you just lost me. This is where the chemistry gets really troubling. And I was never really good at chemistry, but I am beginning to understand, I am beginning to understand Fenton reactions. It's all based on what's called reactive oxygen species. They're, they're compounds, molecules of oxygen with other things that uh, are highly oxidative and they will chew tissue to pieces. And, in fact, when they tell you the iron preservation story, they're, they're kind of admitting that they're hopeful that there's more cross-linking going on than actual tissue degradation. So both of those things are happening at the same time. Uh, ever had a chrome bumper in Detroit over the winter? Yeah. You know what iron does to a chrome bumper. What's it going to do to tissue? Yeah. So the blood is important in this scheme. The, the clots keep the iron from interacting with water and making these hydroxyls and peroxyls and very destructive oxidative molecules. The literature's full of this stuff. In fact, there's a whole area of science alone called lipid peroxidation. Remember that one, Doc? Read about that one? <laughs> no. <laughs> I know, it's very complicated. But they, they, they are whistling past the graveyard in some cases on these explanations. They really, they don't, they don't make sense. If the, if the iron is kept away from the water, uh, how can it make Fenton reactions and go into uh, the tissues and preserve them? Plus, we, we saw them restricted to the canals. The clots also limit water flow. You need a lot of water flow over iron to get Fenton reactions. You need a lot of water flowing over iron, Fe2, Fe3, to get peroxyls and hydroxyls. And this sequesters all that. Now, they did an experiment to prove that iron is really what's preserving these tissues. And they took uh, vessels out of ostrich and emu, and they took blood out of chicken and ostrich, and their experimental design was to hang these vessels, these tissues, in blood for, I don't know, a couple of years. That was their experiment, yeah? What happens to blood when you take it out of a living organism? <laughs> it clots! It clots! You don't believe me? Go home and cut your finger no. and bleed it out on the counter and come back tomorrow morning. Tell me what it looks like. It's clotted. So what did they do? They put an anticoagulant in it. Where did the dinosaurs buy that? Yeah, where was that on the plains of uh, the Hell Creek Formation? So they had to put an anticoagulant in it. Why? To keep it from clotting. Why? They needed the blood to be unclotted for the experiment. Well, right away we have a problem because I can't picture dinosaur blood just sitting there going, yeah, okay, whatever you need, I'll wait. 
okay? What did they do next? They removed all cell membranes and platelets. They took all the platelets out of your blood, which are the little sticky things that cause clots. They took all of the cell membranes. So they, they broke open all the red blood cells mechanically. They broke them all open mechanically. They, they ran them through filters, took out all the cell membranes. Then they ran it through molecular filters. And they took all the clotting factors, all the proteins, all the enzymes that are involved in clotting. <laughs> are you being getting to see a problem with this experiment? Right? They ran it through high-speed centrifuges six times. I'm talking 60,000 RPM. And then there's this little pellet on the bottom, and they take off all the liquid, resuspend that thing, and spin it down again. Come on! If you're going to do an experiment about dinosaur soft tissue and prove that blood preserved it, don't do all this other stuff. Right? And then they soaked it on a laboratory bench in an air-conditioned lab for two years, and then they looked at it and said, wow, it looks, I don't know, good. That's literally what they said. So, yeah, the clots throw the iron theory into question, right? So we think we've got a good explanation for what did not preserve these. So your question to me is logically, well, what did preserve them? I don't know. In fact, I can't give you any good explanation as a soft tissue processing expert who used to work with tissues on ice in the laboratory, when I was preparing tissues for the microscope, on ice you go. All my solutions, four degrees centigrade, on ice, everything. This stuff's been out of the ground. Some of these bones have been out of the ground for eight years. And I'm still getting tissues and nerves out of them. How is that possible? I don't know. But I, I know what I'm getting. One forensic scientist actually said, no, you're just looking at cellulose fibers. You're, you're not finding nerves. Okay, remember that picture I showed you before? Well, I did it again. Here's a clot with the pin. Here's the pin down here. It's a little more magnified. But that shows the density of this iron. Then I did a low-power thin section of the dimetrodon jaw. And you can see all these clots in it, much like those other pictures I showed you. And, and I compared this in my paper to another figure from a well-known paleontologist and said, look. He's got clots too. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see what the editor does with that. Here's an unidentified sauropod dinosaur from, this was published in uh, 2005. Chinsami, who's really well known in dinosaur bone work. So the microstructure of dinosaur bone, full of clots. Look at all these clots. I can't wait to put them under my UV microscope. As I mentioned, the scientific literature is full of Images that show clots. Here's a book, a 684-page book on the lower Permian from Waurika, which was about 50 miles from where we were digging. And there's our friend right on the cover. Right? Here's that tooth that is in the jar down there. That's the one we found. And we found this whole jar, jaw right here. So. Anyway, Kieran Davis, 2018. This is the most authoritative work. Look at all the clots in that tooth section. Look at all those clots. And they're better. I mean, they're, I should have brought the book with me, but it's so darn heavy. But every picture in there, full of clots. Here's a cross-section of that, uh, that vertebra, and this is the, the vertebral spine that, that goes up. So they, they cross-sectioned it as it went up off the ver vertebra, and look at the big, thick clots in there. So I think all these organisms died in the same event. Yeah. Here's our jaw. So that's a beautiful clot in the jaw. I think I have another one. Yeah. So we're getting good corroboration of this over and over. Now, as I mentioned, we, we have found nerves. We reasoned that not only would there be uh, blood clots in these canals, but remember what travels in here. If you look at this diagram here, you can see it better. There's a vessel, a vein, and a nerve. You see that? They travel together. It's called a neurovascular bundle. The yellow is the nerve, vessel vein and a nerve. They often travel in a triad called the neurovascular bundle. And so we reasoned, well, uh, if we're finding vessels and veins, which we are, everybody's been finding vessels and veins, Dr. Schweitzer and many others, we thought, well, why not nerves? 
but nobody's been examining for nerves. And so when we went to look for them, we found them everywhere. And uh, that's the nerve paper, which we published early this year. And because we're talking about Dimetrodon tonight, I'm not going not to talk a lot about nerves, but the, the limb bones that we're finding, including the new ones from the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History, uh, we're putting these in decal, and so many nerves are popping out of them. I throw the first, like, 30 or 40 nerves away. Because I'm not really sure what I have yet, and frankly, I don't want to look. So I kind of, the, the, the very first, uh, 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 um, the very first vessels that yield nerves, I kind of pour them down the drain. Because uh, I'm getting so many, it's scary. But then after I do that, I re-decalcify, and those nerves I collect, and that's what we're seeing. And this, this appeared in 1943. This is Gleese's picture of this epineurium and perineurium, which are the tissues that make up the nerve. And we found it. We found it, not just in Cretaceous, but we're finding it in Permian. Not only are we finding this beautiful diagnostic crosshatch, which shows, yeah, we've got nerve fibers. We're finding lipids. I don't know if you can see the lipids in here, but there's actual lipid droplets. See some of them here? Those came out of this. Oil floats on water or aqueous solutions, right? I've got a picture that has a whole bubble trail of lipids going up to the surface from one nerve. <laughs> So lipids, that's like taking a bottle of Wesson oil and, and pouring it out on the five freeway and coming back in 1,000 years, 10,000 years, and it's still there. Yeah, not likely. Well, just to whet your appetite a little bit, if you take those nerves, these ones right here, and instead of looking at them lengthwise, you cross-section them and highly magnify that. You will find cells that wrap the axons. What are the axons? Those are the part of the nerve that transmits the electrical signal. Yeah? It trans transmits an, an action potential really fast, 100 meters per second in some cases. And so those cables are wrapped in an insulator, much like the old coaxial cables that you used to plug into the back of your television set. If you cut away that rubber, rubber cutting, cu uh, covering, what do you see in there? You see that crosshatch <laughs> of metal that they invented to put around our coaxial cables. How interesting. But if you magnify even higher and you look at the cells that are wrapping the actual axons, the, the electrical fibers, they are wrapped with a cell whose only job is to go around and around and around and around and make fat. That's its two jobs. Coat this axon in an insulator so that electrical signal travels with fidelity. So these are called myelin sheaths. These are the myelin sheaths that wrap these axons. That's an axon right there. That's 200 nanometers. Now, how small is that? Well, your hair is 100 microns wide, 100 microns. One of those microns, so take one one hundredth of your hair and divide that into 1,000 pieces. You with me? Take one one hundredth of your hair, slice that into 1,000 pieces. 200 of those are in that line right there. That's 200 of those. Yeah. Look at how tiny this structure is. This is from a frozen ice man that they recovered from the Alps, who they estimate at 5,000 years old. Look at the myelin sheath around that. So that is going to be my next impossible picture, Lord willing, from dinosaur nerves. Now, I think that there's a site in Alaska that is frozen and has been in permafrost ever since they were buried. And so I think the likelihood of finding this and even maybe even an intact dinosaur brain might be pretty cool, yeah? 
So, all right. Well, I'm going to switch to Q&A and videos, but let's show you some videos first because I, I got some pretty cool videos to show. This is the one that started everything. I think you remember this one. Remember this one? This is the one that they used in his Genesis history. So I peeled this right off of that Triceratops hornbone down there. I peeled, but I broke it open with my hands, peeled that off. I put it in formalin, formaldehyde, and this is what it looked like a few days later. Perfectly stretchy. Now I thin sectioned that, and it was full of cells. It made the cover of American Laboratory. And that got me in trouble at the university. By the way, all you have to do is Google that and you find all about that. Okay. Um, here is a nerve that I pulled out of a limb bone. So this was, this was a Permian limb bone. You can see the nerve sticking out there, yeah? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to see. Let's play it. I'm going to try to grab it with my forceps, and I want to grab it and show you how it snaps when I pull it. So, see it snap? Watch it. See it snap? It snap? It's like a piece of rubber. See it snap? That's a nerve that I pulled out of a 270 million year old limb bone. Is that somebody's phone? All right. Uh, here's another uh, nerve. Now this nerve, I put this under. See, I need to turn this. I put this under the microscope and just videotaped me stretching it. So I want you to see how stretchy these nerves are. Yeah. You see that? Look, there's a dinosaur in the earth. Look, look, look. She's not even looking at me. I can't even get girls, little girls' attention. I'll show this to you again. So this was the nerve that I, I took out of the limb bone. I fixed it in a fixative, and, and I'm just pulling on it here with two fine needle forceps. Pretty cool, eh? That's that one. All right. Um, here's where I went back to my specimen in the refrigerator. So once I found the soft tissue on this piece of horn bone, and I literally just took this guy, it was further up the horn up here, but I literally just broke it with my hands. And that surface, in fact, it's this surface right here, I just peeled that stuff off of there. So I didn't, didn't process it at all. And what I did later is I went back to the same specimen after I had it in the refrigerator for about a year and I peeled it off again. So here you see me peeling this off this piece of bone. And I come in with my fine needle forceps. All I did was rehydrate, rehydrate this. I took it out of the refrigerator. I put it in phosphate buffered saline, which is basically salt water. And look at how I'm just lifting it off the bone, that's the soft tissue. And so if you thin section this, you'll see cells in it. So this is, this is full of those bone cells. And so this is what the bone is like before it hardens. All right, what else have I got here? Uh, okay. This is a pretty cool one. So when we work with these dinosaur tissues, we can stain them with laboratory stains. So they respond to current laboratory methods, which is really cool. They're not permineralized. They will take up a stain. In this case, I used uh, a stain called acr acridine orange. And what it does is it attaches to RNA or DNA. If it attaches to DNA, it glows green. If it attaches to RNA, it glows red. All right. So here's a structure from a dinosaur bone that's glowing red because I stained it with this dye and it's saying, yes, I have RNA, number one. Number two, what kind of tissue is this? This is called a vein valve, okay? 
Your veins have valves in them. Why? Because it's, it's under low pressure in the veins and the heart's trying to push it back to the heart, right? And, and it doesn't have enough power like, like the, the, you know, I forget the vessel that it goes, the aorta. I guess the aorta is the strong one, right? And that's what puts all the pressure into the blood system. By the time it gets back through the veins, there's no pressure. So it needs valves to hold the blood in place until it gets back to the heart. Yeah? Make sense? This is a vein valve. This is falling out of a vein, which is impossible to dissect out. When you, when you try to dissect out vein valves out of veins from a mouse, can't get them out. This one fell out. Now, because it's a valve, it has two cuspids on it. You have tricuspid valves in your heart. This is a bicuspid valve. One, one actually, you know, they go opposite ways, right? And so these valves are one micron thin, one one hundredth the width of one of your hairs. Now, in this case, they're both present and they are closed. How do I know that? Because there's liquid in here and there are bacteria that came back to life and you're going to see them swirling around in here. See them swirling? Those are bacteria that I have revived. They're inside the vein valve. They cannot swim out. Why? They're being blocked. They're blocked in by the cuspids that are holding them in place and everything is glowing red. The living and the dead. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? I don't know. You may not appreciate that video as much as I do. Um, okay. Here's, uh, here's a Permian nerve. You can't see it. It's right here. But I'm going to start shaking the vessel. And then you can see it on the bottom of the vessel. So you got to know what you're doing when you're collecting these things. But hey, it's a lot of fun. The kids have a great time. The PhDs are dumbfounded. And uh, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right. Question. <laughs>